And good day, my listeners. We're at chapter 11 of the book of Jeremiah. Thank you for joining me. It's always a pleasure. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Notes. Now, some have said this is Jeremiah's fourth commission. The word begins this first verse, which came from the Lord, and which could have been the salvation of the nation, but they simply would not take the message. Verse 2. Hear the words of this covenant, and speak unto the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Notes. Now, this covenant refers to the book of the law that had been found in the temple some years previously during the reign of King Josiah, and which originated the re uh, revival uh, proposed by that good monarch. Immediately following his death, the nation went right back to their old garbage found in verses 9 through 10. They went back to the idolatry that Josiah had led them out of. Verse 3, And say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Cursed be the man who obeys not the words of this covenant. Notes. Now, the word curse, describing the law, uh, actually it means a death sentence, condemned to death. Well, this is the function of the law. It cannot give life to dead men. It condemns lawbreakers. The law was given to make man conscious of his moral condition as a sinner in his need of a savior. Uh, the tabernacle and its sacrificial system which accompanied the law revealed that savior in symbology. Okay. All the Ten Commandments really were were God's rap sheet against humanity saying that, hey, this is the standard that I have and this is what you cannot do within yourself. You can look at any one of those Ten Commandments and you've broken every last one of them, I assure you. Verse 4, Which I commanded your fathers in that day that I brought them forth out of the land of Egypt from the iron furnace, saying, Obey my voice, and do them according to all which I command you, so shall you be my people, and I will be your God. Notes. Now, God does not ask men to obey him as a selfish and tyrannical master, uh, ordering a slave in order to gratify his own cruel temper, but he commands man's obedience in order to secure man's happiness. Egypt was likened to an iron furnace from which the people were delivered, but yet they seemed determined to go back to this hot iron furnace. Uh, you can read the book of Exodus, and God had to strike many of his own people down because they wanted to go back to Egypt. Oh, that we would not even have the chance of dying in this desert. Hey, you've got God right in front of you, circus clown. Verse 5. Then I may perform the oath which I have sworn unto your fathers to give them a land flowing with milk and honey as it is in this day. Then answered I and said, So be it, O Lord. Notes. Now, a land flowing with milk and honey is found some 15 times in the Pentateuch and some 5 times elsewhere. The Lord kept His promise as He always keeps His promises and gave them the land. However, there was a problem. His children did not keep their promises to him. In truth, man fails in every test to which he is actually exposed. Therefore, it was imperative that God become man, which he did in the person of Christ, and did for man what man could not do for himself. You cannot save yourself. Verse 6. Then the Lord said unto me, Proclaim all these words in the cities of Judah, and in the streets of Jerusalem, saying, Hear ye the words of this covenant, and do them. Notes. Now, I, I find this kind of interesting right here. Basically, God is telling Jeremiah to be a street preacher, both in Jerusalem and the cities of Judah. He carried in his hand the Bible and caused the people to hear his words and urged his followers to believe and obey them. Well, I should say the Bible that they had back then. Certainly didn't have the New Testament then. But the urgency of this action by the Holy Spirit portrays the near catastrophe. It was just around the corner. Verse 7. For I earnestly protested unto your fathers in the day that I brought them up out of the land of Egypt, even unto this day, rising early and protesting, saying, Obey my voice. Notes. 
Now, the sense of this passage is that the protesting, it did not begin with Jeremiah, but in fact has been needful from the very time they were delivered from Egypt. Well, the cup is now full. Not only full, it's about ready to run over. All he asked was, Obey my voice, and this is all he asked today. He doesn't do that because he's some tyrannical master that just wants to bully a slave around. He does that because he is actually genuinely concerned with your happiness. And sometimes doing God's will is rather tough, as Jeremiah is soon going to find out. Verse 8. Yet they obeyed not, nor inclined their ear, but walked every one in the imagination of their evil heart. Therefore I will bring upon them all the words of this covenant which I commanded them to do, but they did them not. Notes. Now Jeremiah contrasted the teachings of the Bible with those of the human imagination and declared the latter to be wicked and evil, and that the wrath predicted in the word of God would certainly strike those who accepted this false religion of the imagination. And, of course, we're talking about the idols. Verse 9, And the Lord said unto me, A conspiracy is found among the men of Judah and among the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Notes. Now, it's pretty clear to me from verses 9 through 10 that King Josiah's subjects uh, secretly decided to return to idolatry and to set aside the Bible as the first favorable opportunity. And this is the conspiracy that the word is talking about. Verse 10. They are turned back to the iniquities of their forefathers, which refused to hear my words, and they went after other gods to serve them. The house of Israel and the house of Judah have broken my covenant, which I made with their fathers. Notes. Now their forefathers refers back to the sins of the Israelites in the wilderness, and in Canaan, and under the judges, uh, the righteous prophets, uh, were, they were constantly pointing their hearers back to those early times, either for warning, as here, or actually for encouragement. And they went after other gods to serve them, refers not really to the past, but actually to the present in this case. They broke the covenant which the Lord had made with them by going back to bowing down to uh, statues, wood carvings, pieces of art, things of that nature, uh, praying to trees and stupid things like that, humming into crystals. Uh, that doesn't do any good for nobody. It's a waste of time. Verse 11. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will bring evil upon them, which they shall not be able to escape, and though they shall cry unto me, I will not hearken unto them. Notes. Now the words, I will, once again, emphasize the fact that the Lord controls, he, he's in control. I mean, there's just no doubt about it. They shall not be able to escape refers to the idea in the minds of the people of Judah that if the prophecies of Jeremiah perchance are right, they will find a way to escape, namely Egypt. When the terrible time came, they found no way of escape. And not only did... Uh, not only did King Nebuchadnezzar capture Israel and Jerusalem, but he, he beat up on Egypt pretty bad as well. And that's real history right there. Verse 12. <clears throat> then shall the cities of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem go and cry unto the gods unto whom they offer incense, but they shall not save them at all in the time of their trouble. <clears throat> Notes. The sheer impotency of idols to do anything is recorded through verses 11 through 14. A history attests this fact for the people of Judah were overthrown by the Chaldeans and carried captive into Babylon. Verse 13. For according to the number of your cities were your gods, O Judah, and according to the number of the streets of Jerusalem, have you set up altars to that shameful thing, even altars to burn incense unto Baal? Notes. Now, not only does idolatry bring shame upon idolaters, but the most popular idol of that time was so shameful that a description of it is really hard to go by. Uh, you can look up uh, Baal worship in... Uh, uh, you can go on the internet and look at that, but let me tell you, you're getting ready to have your mouth 
uh, you're getting ready to have some uh, it's just impossible to describe just how vile this idol is and it was all over their cities they'd rather pray to a male's productive uh, productive organ than to actually pray to God himself that's just how low they'd sunk I mean it, it's hard for me to even say uh, those particular words because that's just about the most disgusting thing I've heard all day verse 14 Therefore, pray not thou for this people, neither lift up a cry of prayer for them. For I will not hear them in the time that they cry unto me for their trouble. Notes. Now the die has already been cast now. There is no hope for their deliverance. It does not mean that if they truly repented, the Lord would not hear. Actually, he definitely would hear in such a case, but it does mean that there is no chance of them doing such. So there is no point uh, in interceding for them. They've made up their minds. They're going to serve idols no matter what happens. The implication also is that if that they will cry unto me when the Babylonians come, but then it will actually be too late. They will definitely cry to God, but it's going to be whenever they're in the captivity. And Nebuchadnezzar is going to have some fun with them. Verse 15. What has my beloved to do in my house, seeing she has wrought lewdness with many, and the holy flesh is passed from you? When you do evil, then you rejoice. Notes. Now the Jewish people, it would seem, came to the temple to pray and do their normal activities, but their prayer is not accepted because it is associated with unholy practices. Actually, they were not truly praying, but only going through the form. Uh, they had a ritual without any righteousness. Now, when they when it says, when they do evil, then they rejoice, this refers to two things. They rejoiced in their idol worship, foolishly thinking that such would deliver them. And number two, they rejoiced in the thought that by their temple ritual, they had paid their debt to God and could therefore continue in their evil. What foolishness it will cost them. Verse 16, the Lord called your name a green olive tree, fair and of goodly fruit. With the noise of a great tumult, he has kindled fire upon it, and the branches of it are broken. Notes. Now, national Israel, throughout the word of God, and even right now, is symbolized by the green olive tree. But the tumult was the Chaldean invasion symbolized here by a thunderstorm with lightning and the storm destroys the tree and the lightning sets it on fire. Verse 17 For the Lord of hosts who planted you has pronounced evil against you for the evil of the house of Israel and of the house of Judah which they have done against themselves to provoke me to anger and offering incense unto Baal. Notes for the Lord of hosts has planted you. This refers to Israel being a peculiar people under God as no other people or nation. He was their sponsor in the sense that he has never been the sponsor of any other particular people. But when it says against themselves, this refers to men sinning to their own hurt. The idea is that God is not the cause of this, but they themselves. And they just simply would refuse to get out of idolatry. <clears throat> and a most detestable idol at that. Verse 18. And the Lord has given me knowledge of it, and I know it. Then you showed me their doings. Notes. Well, whenever it says that the Lord has given me knowledge of it, refers to a plot against Jeremiah's life, and by his own brethren at that. And how the, Lord, how the Lord showed him this is really not actually known. Uh, probably through a simple, uh, probably through speaking to Jeremiah, uh, Jeremiah directly. Just my opinion. Anyways, their doings referred to murderous intent against the prophet because they could not stand the strength and power of his preaching. Scripturally, they could not refute his message. Therefore, they sought to destroy the messenger. Verse 19, 
But I was like a lamb or an ox that is brought to the slaughter, and I knew not that they had devised devices against me, saying, Let us destroy the tree with the fruit thereof, and let us cut him off from the land of the living, that his name may be no more remembered. Notes Jeremiah came unto his own, and his own received him not. They resolved to kill him, though he was to them as a gentle lamb, and his only crime was that he prophesied to them in the name of the Lord. Anathoth was his native village. It belonged to the priest, and uh, they, together with the members of the prophet's family, joined in this plot to destroy him. Well, so was it with the Messiah, to whom Jeremiah is actually here a type. He made many enemies telling the truth. Verse 20. But, O Lord of hosts, who judges righteously, who tries the reins and the heart, let me see your vengeance on them, for unto you have I revealed my cause. Notes. You can kind of see that Jeremiah is beginning to see what's really going to happen. There's just really no hope for them to repent. The prayer of this verse concerns the conflict between the truth and righteousness versus falsehoods and evils. It corresponds to similar language in the lips of David and of the Apostle Paul. You can find what I'm speaking of in Galatians 1, 8 and 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 22. Now, Jeremiah would not take vengeance into his own hands, but gave place to wrath, in effect, stepped aside so as to give room for the wrath of God to act. Romans chapter 12, verse 19. Go ahead and read it later. Verse 21. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of the men of Anathoth, who seek your life, saying, Prophesy not in the name of the Lord that you die not by our hand. Notes. Now that the plot is revealed, the demand is that he stop prophesying. Their anger was because of his message. We don't want to hear you trying to save us. Very well. Verse 22. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will punish them. The young men shall die by the sword. Their sons and their daughters shall die by famine. Notes. Now, verses 22 and 23 record the answer to Jeremiah's prayer. The Lord said, Behold, I will punish them. However, this punishment would consist of the destruction that was coming by the hand of the Babylonians. It did not necessarily include any extra punishment unless it contained a guarantee that their perpetrators would be included in the sword and the famine. The question in many hearts is, if these had sincerely repented before Jeremiah and before the Lord, would their repentance have been accepted? Most definitely it would have, but sadly... No repentance was forthcoming. Uh, divine wrath necessitated their destruction. They were simply not going to learn their lesson. Verse 23. And there shall be no remnant of them, for I will bring evil upon the men of Anathoth, even the year of their visitation. <clears throat> Notes. Now, to touch God's anointed and his chosen people is to touch God himself. As Anathoth was where uh, many priests resided, this was a special judgment on the priesthood who had been so instrumental in steering Judah and Jerusalem into paths of unrighteousness. Therefore, God's anger against them was twofold. Number one, because of leading Judah and Jerusalem astray. And number two, because of the plot against Jeremiah. Uh, these preachers and priests and pastors, whatever they called themselves at that time, they are plotting to actually destroy the true preacher, the true teacher. The flesh will always try to destroy the spirit. Verse, or chapter 12 now. Righteous are you, O Lord, when I plead with you. Yet let me talk with you of your judgments. Wherefore does the way of the wicked prosper? Wherefore are all they happy who deal very treacherously? Notes. Now the words, Righteous are you, O Lord. This presents the answer of Jeremiah as he hastens to vindicate God, even in the midst of his sorrows and dangers. 
The Lord judged righteously and was himself righteous, yet the prophet desired to reason with the Lord of his action in permitting evil, or so it seemed to prosper. Well, such is the question of many. The questions of Jeremiah are proof that those who are the recipients of special divine revelations and who are in close communion with the Lord are not precluded from having doubting thoughts and spiritual distress. Look no further than the book of Job. I mean, that guy was under some serious pressure. Probably more pressure than any human being who has ever lived. Uh, being close to God does not mean that you're not going to have trouble. Being close to God actually provokes this world against you. Verse 2. You have planted them, yes. They have taken root. They grow, yes. They bring forth fruit. You are near in their mouth and far from their reins. Notes. When it says you have planted them, it refers back to chapter 11, verse 17. Uh, chapter 11, verse uh, 17, yeah. Jeremiah reasons that if God planted them, and in fact Israel took root and became a great nation, in effect brought forth fruit, why did they not glorify him instead of doing, uh, becoming evildoers? Instead, they brought forth evil fruit, in other words. Matthew chapter 7, verse 17, Jesus teaches on that. But the answer is found in the last phrase. The words, you are near in their mouth and far from their reins, refers to priests who, who run their mouths and ratchet jaw at the services, but their hearts were bound to their idols and to their wicked sins. They could talk the talk, but they just simply could not walk the walk. Verse 3. But you, O Lord, know me. You have seen me and tried my heart toward you. Pull them out like sheep for the slaughter and prepare them for the day of slaughter. Notes. Now in this scripture we are delving into the innermost chamber of the heart of Jeremiah. For such the Lord will carefully and patiently rebuke him. Verse 4. How long shall the land mourn and the herbs of every field wither for the wickedness of them who dwell therein? The beasts are consumed and the birds because they said he shall not see our last end. Notes. He shall not see our last end refers to the prophet's enemies who were confident of a successful future for themselves and for Jerusalem, but were determined that Jeremiah should not see their good fortune nor share in it, well, because they determined to kill him. In this passage we have the prophetic doctrine that because of the wickedness of them who dwell therein, the land mourns, the crops do not grow as they should, and the beast and the birds suffer. In this one verse is easily seen the cause of most of the problems which plague humanity. Well, actually the truth is, all of our problems are tied with some kind of wickedness. It is wickedness. Verse 5, and this is God's answer to Jeremiah. If you have run with the footmen, and they have wearied you, then how can you contend with horses? And if in the land of peace wherein you trusted they wearied you, then how will you do in the, in the swelling of Jordan? Notes. Now Jeremiah had been speaking in the first four verses with the Lord now speaking in the remainder. Now comes the Lord's gentle rebuke to the prophet. The footman represent the men of Anathoth, the horsemen, the rulers of Jerusalem, whose hatred and bloodthirst would be far worse than Anathoth's. The land of peace in which he thought himself secure was his own village. The swelling of the Jordan, the wild fury that he would have to face in the capital city. Verse 6. For even your brethren and the house of your father even they have dealt treacherously with you. Yes, they have called a multitude after you. Believe them not, though they speak fair words unto you. Notes. Now, right here we have a good indicator of some things. Though they speak fair words unto you, 
it seems to imply that the Lord is imparting information to Jeremiah that he has not previously had. He now informs him that in the plot to take his life, his own brethren, even those of his own house, the house of his father, which would imply his nearest of kin, they are actually involved in this. His family urges those who are opposed to Jeremiah to murder him, but to his face they spoke kind and gentle words. Sounds a lot like the mafia. The, the people who are wanting to kill you are coming to you with smiles on their face. This divine revelation to him of the treachery of his relatives must have very, very much hurt him. I mean, your mother and father are trying to put a whack job out on you. That's pretty heavy stuff. That's heavy persecution. And thus the prophet was trained to feel how bitter was the pain that hurt the heart of God when sinful men, in response to the Messiah's love, met him with hatred and murder and malice. They told every lie that they could about him. Verse 7, <clears throat> I have forsaken my house, I have left my heritage, I have given the dearly beloved of my soul into the hand of her enemies. Notes. Now the Lord speaks his heart as Jeremiah spoke his. These verses beginning with the 7th verse on to the end of, chap of the chapter apply to Judah and Jerusalem and are therefore to be distinguished from those of the previous section which relate solely to Anathoth. But anyways, this verse even supplies more answers to verse 1. When God, for reasons satisfactory to himself, withdraws from active interference in the affairs of men and leaves them to their own hell-bent desire, the result is always oppression of the weak by the strong and the robbery of the poor by the rich. Evil and violent men will then begin to prosper, and good people trying to do the right thing will become the target. Believe me, I know all about that. Uh, you go out and you find some rough, nasty characters and you start trying to tell them about Jesus. You're asking to get your face punched in. I've had that quite a bit in my life. Verse 8. My heritage is unto me as a lion in the forest. It cries out against me, therefore have I hated it. Notes. <clears throat> So degraded and hostile had idolatry made Judah that they are compared in verses 8 and 9 to an angry lion and a fierce vulture, such as man's moral response to God's wonderful love. The word hated in this verse means less cared for or less favored. You see, the Hebrew verb is not the same as the verb which means to hate with malice, but it signifies to love or prefer less. Uh, for example, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated, in effect, preferred less. I can't think of which book that's actually in. I think it's in the first verse of Zechariah, or first chapter somewhere. Uh, be that as it may, I know I've referred to it before, I just can't think of it on the top of my head. Verse 9. My heritage is unto me as a speckled bird, the birds round about are against her. Come ye, assemble all the beasts of the field, come to devour. Notes. When it says, My heritage is unto me as a speckled bird, it refers to a bird of beautiful bright uh, plumage, which arouses the animosity of its less brilliant contemporaries who gather around to pull it to pieces. The prosperity of Judah, no doubt, had long been a source of wonder to the surrounding nations. They witnessed her prospering, uh, greatness, blessing, and grandeur, knowing there was a difference, and a great difference at that, but not quite understanding what the difference was. The difference back then was that they were actually serving God in truth and in righteousness, and thus they were like a big, beautiful, speckled bird. Now, she's uh, being destroyed by her own idolatry. With that being said, we'll have to pick up in chapter 12, verse 10 of the book of Jeremiah. Thank you and God bless. I'll see you later. Bye-bye.